Hello and welcome to ICF LinkedIn Live. Today, I'm super excited to have a good friend and colleague joining us, Dory Clark. Dory, wonderful having you. I don't know why it took us so long to have you in, but here we are. Magda, I love it. Thank you so much. It's great to get to connect. And you know, if you were to Google Dory, you will find a rather eclectic uh, background and uh, quite, a, quite a story. So, um, top 50 uh, thinkers, 50 business thinkers, right? Uh, teaching at Duke University, writing uh, uh, blogs, writing columns for uh, Harvard Business Review, uh, having a degree in psychology and then theology. It's well, like, okay. Philosophy and theology, yep. All right. So, and, and I think to many, you're probably known best as the author, a uh, fairly frequent speaker and, and, and also offerer of very interesting um, training that people can take. Uh, so t tell me a little bit how you, how you came about, how it came about what you do and, um, and what sparked you to being in this particular field. Yeah, thank you very much, Magda. So I very briefly came to the work that I'm doing now through a little bit of a circuitous path. I originally thought I was going to be an academic. And so I got a master's degree in, in theology and decided I wanted to get a doctorate. And I ended up getting turned down by all of the doctoral programs I applied to. So I had to come up with a new plan. So I did. And I became a journalist. And then I got laid off from that. So I had to come up with another plan. So you can you can see I, early on the the groundwork was laid for me to uh, to write my first book, uh, Reinventing You, because I was basically forced by fate and happenstance to uh, <laughs> to do that. Um, so I was a journalist that didn't work. So I went to work for political campaigns. I became right. a spokesperson on a on a governor's race, a spokesperson on a presidential race. They both lost. Uh, so I ran a nonprofit. And then eventually, while I was running the nonprofit, I realized, wait a minute, I could work for myself. And fortunately, mm -hmm. that stuck. And so for the past 17 years, I have been self-employed uh, doing a combination of marketing strategies, speaking, consulting, and coaching. Yeah. And I was one, you know, I was just, just uh, reminiscing uh, because I think for the first time in person, I met you in London 2019 at Thinkers 50. Um, you were nominated I think we met before that. Yeah. I think I, 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 was either, either. I was at Thinkers 50 in 2017. Maybe we okay. met there. Hey, yes, yes, yes. You're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was 17. And then and then it was so cool to see you at the Thinkers 50 were nominated in different categories. But of course, I've known of you and, and especially reading your column in Harvard Business Review, uh, a long time uh, subscriber to your to your newsletter. Uh, which I read religiously. They're always, they're so practical and they're, you know, short reads. How do you get an inspiration to doing this newsletter, you know, so frequently? And every single time there is something new in there that it's exciting and inspiring and practical, as I said. Oh, well, you're you're so nice to, to say that. Thank you, Magda. I appreciate it. For For anyone who Magda has sold on the experience, you can actually sign up for the newsletter if you'd like at doryclark.com slash subscribe. Uh, but so you can see for yourself. But, you know, broadly speaking, one of the tenets that I really try to follow is I think a mistake that a lot of us make, and we tend to get overwhelmed as a result of it, is we assume that, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, there's all these things I have to do and there's not enough time. I have to, I have to write articles and I have to do podcasts and then I have to work on my newsletter and then I have to, bup, 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 and it's all these marketing activities. And of course, you would never have enough time if all of these were separate and discrete activities. Wow. But something I've really tried to sort of force myself to do, and I think it's often hard for us because we assume that everything we do has to be unique and new and bespoke, is just really get smarter about leveraging things you've already done. And so, you know, to my shame, it took me a while to really understand the the value and the power of newsletters. So, I mean, I had newsletters for a long time, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't really have a theory of newsletters or how to make them good. I, I really started to get much more attuned to that around 2015. But so since 2010, 
I have really had a very aggressive content creation calendar for myself. And a big part of my business and how I grew my business was writing articles. And yeah. for a period of about three years, I did it a ton. I was writing 10 to 15 articles a month for places like Forbes, for HBR. At the time, I was doing it for like Huffington Post, you know, all these places. And so I have just honestly a huge catalog of content that I've developed over the years, like probably 800 plus articles. And so a lot of the newsletter, frankly, is going back into the archives and identifying things that I've done in the past that mm. are, oh, this is still good. This is still interesting. Let me highlight this again. Let me shine a light on it. Let me make it relevant for people. And then writing a newsletter uh, that will that will sort of le lead into that and then link to the article. So it actually but thankfully at this point doesn't take a ton of time because mm. I've previously created so much content that I can point people to. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the short version. I'm curious though, Magda, I'd love to hear a little bit more, you know, how, how did you first get into the coaching world? Was it, was it an accident that, or, or like <laughs> when, when you were in Poland, were you already like the earliest adopter in the world of coaching? And then, and then you're like, surprise, now I'm in Kentucky. Now I'm running this organization. <laughs> no, no. Serendipity as well, you know, and, and, and very um, unusual as it typically is. Right. Uh, I, I, I know a few people who just said their intention on being X and it happens uh, anymore. The stories are very different and, well, we do know that coaches and coaching helps with that. But my story is very different. I uh, I am born and raised in Poland, yes. Uh, my degrees are in economics and international relations. Uh, and early in my uh, professional career, because of a timing, there was a time that Eastern and Central Europe were opening to the uh, to the Western um, um, style, if you will, of, of business and opening up from the former communist or, or socialist era. So there was a time that the United States, especially USAID, was pouring a lot of money into Central and Eastern Europe. So my first job still in grad school, I became an employee of the US federal government. Interesting, wow. In economics. So I worked for economic research service as an economist. And then um, after a while, I actually moved to the uh, not-for-profit sector. So I started my flirtation at that, that time with um, association management, managing uh, not-for-profit organizations. And what do you know, serendipity again, uh, in 2005, I got pinged for um, uh, being an uh, assistant at that point, executive director for the ICF. ICF was looking for, for um, association management at that point. I was familiar with coaching. Was I a user of coaching? No. Uh, but I knew enough to be absolutely intrigued. Uh, and then, you know, then it's the history. Very quickly, I became trained as a coach. Uh, not that I have time to do that. Running ICF is a full-time obligation but i certainly would characterize myself as the leader using coaching skills in my management style but yeah it's been over 17 years and just observing how the field is changing and turning and expanding is it's just phenomenal it's just phenomenal you must have the best longitudinal perspective of anyone i mean that's that's really remarkable i'm curious I mean, I'm sure you have a thousand observations about this, but <laughs> but if you're if you're doing like quick, super high level, like the world of coaching in 2005 versus the world of coaching in 2023, what are the biggest sort of differences or the biggest changes that you know a time traveler would find most stark between these two these two snapshots? Yeah, you know, some could be very uh, 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 statistical. So when I first joined ICF, we had about 8,000 members, predominantly North American. We're 60,000 plus 170 countries. Tells me it is a global phenomenon and definitely not the fad since so many years later, we're not only here, we're growing and prospering. Uh, the other interesting tidbit was that we had about 1,000 holders of the ICF credential. And we just celebrated 50,000 mark. And uh, and that tells me not necessarily, you know, the but of course the uh, uh, the attractiveness of ICF credential, but the fact that the field is getting um, standards, it's getting strong standards, which is another indication of we're here to stay. 
The third one I would say is that uh, universities are keen on uh, teaching coaching, promoting coaching, including coaching in their offerings, not just as an elective, but also to support to their students. Right. And Tom Colditz, our good friend, of course, is, is kind of leading this initiative as well. And the last one I'll say is that I remember my very first couple of years at ICF, we still then defined coaching by what it was not. We did not have a language to describe coaching. No, we're not consultants. No, we're not therapists. No, we're not counselors. No, we're not mentors. So it was what we are not. And since we found a very, very specific language to, to describe coaching and to make it clearly very, very attractive uh, and, and very much more mainstream than it was in 2005. Yeah. Wow. That was great, Magda. I am super impressed. You either like wrote an article exactly like that and already published it and therefore it's in your head, or if not, I heartily encourage you to get a transcript of this and immediately turn it into an article like, you know, 20 year snapshot, how his coaching changed. Yeah. Speaking of reusing and leveraging content, you could basically take that transcript, clean it up and then use it for an article in ICF communications. You could like be sort of tweeting little pieces and doing quote cards on social media, like we just from that monologue. That, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and that was that was a page taken from your um, your your uh, uh, training also on on being recognizable expert. That's one of the offerings that you have, and that that that's very powerful as well. Exactly, yeah. but you know, I think that this is exactly what you said. Leverage what you've done already, and it's not to to you know uh, not being inventive and not doing new things. It's just when something is still relevant why not to use it? Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I think it's almost a pathology for us to think that <laughs> no, everything has to be brand new every single time. It's like, you know what, there is such a huge amount of difference, you know, in, in effort, you know, getting like, okay, zero to a hundred, zero to a hundred, zero to a hundred. And the truth is, if you write, if you actually have taken the time to create something and make it good, you know, an article or a podcast or a video or something like that, why not spend 5% or 10% extra effort, you know, rather than like zero to a hundred on something else to actually get it in front of more people and try to leverage the value of that on different platforms. There's plenty of people that all of us know that maybe, you know, maybe they're on Instagram, but they're never on LinkedIn or vice versa. Right. And if you only put it on one place and say, no, no, I have to, I mean, yes, of course you reformat it a little bit to make it appropriate for that channel. You don't just slap the same thing up in every place, but it's 5% or 10% different effort rather than creating a whole new thing. And it means that thousands of more people are potentially exposed to it. Yeah. And you know, this is something, um, my, my story with you, Dory, uh, I read, um, I think it was in the Harvard Business Review way back when, um, your, your thing about productivity. And uh, I, I tell you that that was my pet peeve when this conversation about work-life balance was on everybody's mind. And I'm like, ah, isn't work part of life? Yeah, it was, it was, it was like, uh, and how could you put a percentage on it? And then I think it was, it was just about an opening of your article. And it was like, no, -uh. you have to make sure that you talk about your life mm. it's everything that you have to know how you utilize in your time not that you come to the office close the door and by five you leave and your mind somehow is being cleared of everything that happened in that day so that what hooked me <laughs> on subscribing to to your to your newsletters and uh, but that that's that's that you know and and i think that we talked several years um, ago um, about the books, about publishing books. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I also was very lucky that you allow me to uh, pick a brain of your publisher, which was just fascinating to know that side of a business. It's not enough to write the book, right? <laughs> it may be brilliant, but if nobody knows about it and it's not promoted correctly, so what? Um, but but there, is, there is something um, about 
bringing the new perspective to to other things that stand out your other book i mean it's it's just it's just again um talking about how to make sure okay we got um, props we got props magda excellent <laughs> um, but but <laughs> excuse me but this is this is it this is this is not about necessarily writing all the time about the same thing but to bring what's needed and this is another um observation from being with icf so long i think that coaching is evolving primarily because the needs of the clients are evolving and the awareness of what coaching can do is evolving and again my personal story i'm still friends with my very first coach from way back when, and uh, and and several years back, I called her. I said I have to apologize to you, and she says, "Why would you apologize?" I said, "Because I was very, um, I, I was not very accessible client at that point. My first experience with coaching, I was a little cautious, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to expect exactly, um, and and later on, I said, now I now I understand what you tried to do there." <laughs> But I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't open. This is why, you know, I, I admire everybody, including ICF and you, of course, for promoting coaching for what it is and for bringing that awareness to people because many think they don't need it. They don't want it. They can't afford it or something else. And, and probably every single one of these uh, uh, statements is not accurate. So, um, so again, as I said, the evolution of the of the demand for coaching and the desire for engaging a coach um, makes the evolution of the entire coaching field uh, rather rather speedy at this point. Yeah, I think that's such a great observation, Magda. And in fact, you know, I remember in the early days of my business. I mean, I was starting right around the same time you were at ICF. Um, you know, I was starting my business in two thousand six, and it it really was part of the culture that we still had to push back on that. No coaching is not remedial. Coaching is not for, you know, for losers if you're doing something <laughs> wrong. And, it, and you, you had to, you had, you know, there was sort of this like defensiveness in the air where it was like, you had to kind of prove that that was the case. And I feel like, you know, ICF deserves a ton of credit for this over the past two decades that has been completely eradicated. That is never part of the conversation now that if you tell someone, oh, blah, 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 my coach, like, it's just not a thing that people are like, oh, what's wrong with you? They're going to be like, oh, that's so interesting. How'd you get a coach? Who's your coach? Tell me about your coach. What are you I learning? Am. Oh, wow. Is your company paying? Oh my God. You must be really valuable if your company's paying for a coach. And it's, it's, it's flipped to being a status symbol mm -hmm. as it should be. As it should. ICF really has done a great job in changing that narrative so profoundly. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of leads me to uh, to your latest book, uh, because the the long term thinker in a short term world. So true. OK, prop, prop. Prop, prop, prop. Thank you. There <laughs> and you I go. love that long game. But it is it is so true because every thing we hear is the the pace is only increasing right the, the 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 pace of change is just amazing the only constant is a change and all those great cliches so so you tackled it in a different way that yeah you have to be agile you have to be um, um available for changing your ways but that strategy needs to be a longer term so tell us a little bit more about where it you know how, how did you come i wholeheartedly agree um and, and it's not easy it's not necessarily easy because we are bombarded by all these influences and it's sometimes hard to stay a course when there are so many disruptions noise or shiny objects uh, pulling us to a different direction. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Magda, of course. I mean, what I realized in the course of writing this book about long-term thinking, the long game, is it's interesting because, you know, it's not that anybody thinks that 
strategic thinking is bad. I mean, they, you know, they don't like pretty much everyone's like, yes, let's be strategic. What a great idea. Um, the, the problem is not in their buy-in. The problem is in their execution. Yeah. And there's so many factors that conspire against us. I mean, you know, we just, we all have these like enormous to-do lists every day. And sometimes just for the sake of our sanity, all we feel like we can do is like, I can't think, I don't have time to think about this. I just have to do it. And, you know, it's true there are periods like that. I mean, there's there's busy periods for all of us. Sometimes you really do just have to head, put your head down and grind. Mm -hmm. But it's also equally true that if that is all we do, if that is our perpetual mode, you mm -hmm. really run into problems because you might have set this agenda six months ago, you know, 12 months ago, 24 months ago. Well, okay, it might have made sense then, but does it make sense now you need to stress test it because circumstances do change. And so it's important for all of us, I think, to, and, and nobody's going to tell you this. Nobody's going to like hand you time on a platter. You have to take it. You have to forcibly say, no, I'm going to lift my head up and, you know, fight for this white space, fight for this little block of time to be able to actually ask the question, wait a minute, is the stuff I'm working so hard on is that still the right stuff? Mm -hmm. Because if it is, God bless. Okay, go back to it. If it's not, I mean, frankly, that's the definition of wasted effort. If you are killing yourself, working hard on the wrong things. So better to find out now so you can change course. Right. And, you know, this is, um, I think, one of those cliches as well about hiring a coach. Because working with a coach is 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 hard work. Uh, and, and, and it is, in my opinion, you know, the best investment you can get into that clarity and into having the accountability partner that may ask you this question exactly. Are you working on the right thing? Uh, not questioning if you're here, if you are working hard enough. It's just, is that the right thing that you're working on? So, um, and of course, you know, there are many other ways that people can be supported, but I think it's, it's important, like with all these different tips, that it is also to have that partner that help you navigate sometimes very complex and complicated ways of finding, finding your true sweet spot and, and sticking with it. Yeah, that's, that's so true. I mean, you're right. That is the value of a coach is that. You know, I mean, I think we all know from experience that it is a heck of a lot easier to see things in other people than it is to see them in ourselves. <laughs> sure. And so, I mean, even if you are a very smart, very capable person, you know, oh, you're very good at strategy in general, that doesn't mean you can do it for yourself. That doesn't mean you're deficient. It just means you're human and we have a lot of things going on. And so having somebody to mirror back to you, to, you know, to ask you thought provoking questions and actually, yeah. you know, like, oh, okay, I guess I do have to address this. Oh, I guess I do need to come up with an answer for this. That is really powerful. I mean, I did a, um, a TEDx talk, um, a while back, which, uh, I, I feel, I feel very fortunate. It's gotten like 2 million views now. Wow. Uh, it was a, uh, a right. TEDx talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. Wow. That's a really long URL. There's actually, <laughs> there's actually a better one guys. It's doryclark.com slash Ted. That's the short link. And it will, uh, it will get you there. But, uh, anyway, it's about the real reasons why we're so busy, busy and yeah. what to do about it. And one of the biggest things, honestly, we, we sometimes realize there's a problem. We're just, we're just emotionally kind of not wanting to deal with it. And so sometimes we throw ourselves into work as a way of distracting ourselves and being able to say, Oh, I can't deal with that. I'm too busy, which sounds like a great excuse until you like hit a wall. And so a coach can sometimes be like, Hmm, really? <laughs> and that, that can make a world of difference. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you, you know, um, I, I think that that we see um, a lot of organizations now um, engaging coaching in a different way. Uh, it used to be reserved just for the C-suite, the top echelon. And now what we know from our research on building coaching cultures, availability of coaching to people throughout the enterprise really changes the culture of the organization in almost like a little bit of a 
behind the scenes type of way because people start having a different uh, point of view and understanding uh, maybe the same language of how to how to work best together as teams especially now when we see younger generations coming to workforce and and they do work differently uh, it's not that their values are so much different but they work differently and their expectation of their management i think is very different did you see that in your in your exchanges yeah i think i think that's that's right i mean you're exactly right magda that having a culture that is you know that is understanding of how coaching works that's receptive of coaching is really powerful because you know it's like anything else right i mean if you um if you have a situation and you know there's a hundred people and 10 of them are you know sort of learning a new language and learning a new way of doing things but 90 of them are not i mean yeah you can sort of forcibly try to change things by fiat, but that is really hard, hard. Um, because they just don't have the context. Everybody's going to be like, why are we doing this? What's the point? Whereas if you really try to seed a culture and ways of thinking, ways of asking questions, wow. ways of relating throughout an organization, just, you know, it's, it's, it's almost inherently simpler because people are on the same page and they get what you're trying to do. Yeah. I think there's, you know, slightly unrealistic to think that one or two people within the entire organization can completely change the organization over. I'm watching your time a little bit because I know that you'll be interviewing our good colleagues uh, very soon as well. Uh, so last question, um, Dory, because there is so much chatter about technology and especially artificial intelligence and coaching. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, so I I've been following the uh, the AI developments pretty closely. It's really fascinating. I've played around with uh, with ChatGPT, <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and and Dolly with the images and and all of that. I mean, it's it's incredible. I think that you know we're seeing a couple of things. I mean, one is that you know ChatGPT is not it's not literally subbing in for a human at this point. But also, we need to recognize this is really just the start of an exponential growth curve, and we can't even imagine how fast change is going to come. So I think that what we're going to have to get smarter and better at, because soon it will be better at us than at doing a lot of things, we need to get smarter about how do you deploy it, how do you use that tool in creative ways, and how, how can we get smarter at it. Tyler Cowen, who's a, a great economist, actually wrote an article that I thought was interesting, making suggestions about the best ways to deploy chat GPT. And one of the things he said was like, look, if you ask it a general question, you're going to get kind of a dumb answer. Like, you know, it's basically like, here, here's a Wikipedia entry. Like, it's not that special. But if you actually ask it to do things like compare or contrast, like, oh, you know, so so how, you know, whatever, you know, how is this modality of coaching different from that mm -hmm. modality of coaching? Like sometimes it can actually make some really smart points. Um, and I think that using it as a thought partner and a thought prompt for us can really help us get much farther faster because it does expedite the thinking that we probably could get to and do on our own, but it would take us a lot longer. Right. And, and you know, this is, this is something that I uh, sometimes uh, smile at. Um, because artificial intelligence already exists. It's here. It's not coming. It's here. And even in coaching uh, world, you know, so many coaches use assessments. That's it. Um, so, uh, so, but as you said, it's very important how we, how we deploy it, how we employ it. Um, and uh, this is why I'm very proud of the coalition that we created at ICF, working with all the coaching platforms that utilize um, AI to, to set an ethical boundary about the use of data, use of information, and also where and how it's best supporting the process of coaching, which is a human exchange after all. Absolutely. Well, Doris, thank you so much for being with us and, and, and joining our team today. And uh, well, I'll, I'll see you soon somewhere, I'm sure. Um, and again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Magda. It's great to talk with you always. And thanks for the great work that you and ICF are doing. Thank you.